Scientific Officer and Regulatory Specialist for MG Chemicals. He's been with MG Chemicals for five years. He's also a member of IPC and ASTM, and he has a PhD in physical chemistry. Well, my topic today is the how to select the best material for organization. As you know, there's many different types of application. It goes from the chicken coop where you have a sensor. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but the chicken coop, the atmosphere is very corrosive. If you want to protect your sensor, you'll have to use a very good protective material to very high-tech applications uh, that you know. So, and actually the surprising thing to me is whenever somebody asks a question about selecting material, it's the wide variety of selection criteria that are given to us. Next slide, please. There are many, many different polymeric materials to choose from. The main ones for organizations are acrylics, urethanes, silicones, paracetylenes, fluoropolymers, and epoxies. These are the main ones. These come in two different, no, no, two different varieties. Thermoplastics and thermosets. I'll go over what these are a bit later on because it flows into what we're going to talk about. And these take different forms, carbon coatings, encapsulants, and potting, which actually mainly means the different thickness that you can apply them with. So there are different ways they can be applied. Next slide. When we get a call, usually about a material, the customer will come with some conception. They'll say, well, they'll pick something they're familiar with. Uh, they'll go according to recommendations from <coughs> either a subcontractor or uh, from a friend, an engineer that they know. Very often, they'll select the material based on a specific property that they are trying to look at. There are used an awful lot of roll of thumbs that are existing in the industry. There are several. And a general wish, take this, for a lower production cost, faster time to market, and fewer in-service failures. That's the commonality in the selection process. And that's what we want to aim to achieve. Next slide, please. Nobody knows everything. The design of an electronic device, the modern one, is a very complex task, and it requires expertise from several different groups. It's a good thing to think of your vendors of materials as part of your team, because actually we have lots of expertise in material selections. Next. So actually, what I'm going to be talking about, this part, let's talk about two parts. The first part, I'll talk about the material selection in an engineering design process. And we'll see what the engineering design process is. <coughs> the next part, we will look at laboratory data and how it fits in with the organization aims that you have. So we'll look at their various properties and try to establish Basically, when you look at a technical data sheet, how can you translate that into your organization goal? Next. <coughs> so, first part, the electronic engineering design process. The engineering design process is a series of steps that your engineering take, team takes to solve a problem. In material selection, there's essentially six steps you should be worried about. The first step, next, please. The first step, actually surprisingly to many people, <coughs> is you have to usually tell the people that you're the material provider, what's the dimension, size, type of material, assembly constraints, because these will act as filters. There's some materials you will not be able to use just because of the dimension of your 
your, your assembly. And things like, well, actually, are you concerned about wicking under the PPA? Things like that need to be discussed up front. Because that affects the material we can subject. Next. The next thing I want to discuss is actually the environmental stressors. What's the temperature range that your assembly will experience? What's the service temperatures? What is the temperature maximum and minimum that you could possibly experience at any time and point? Next. Is your component being going to be exposed to the elements? What's the humidity level? Or are we actually talking full submersion? For example, putting your component under uh, the sea, basically, in the seabed. So an assembly, you just down. Next. What kind of solvent? are going to be in contact with your uh, material, your, your device. Jet fuels? Acids? What kind of liquids are actually going to be interacting? You need to tell your material provider what these things are. Otherwise, actually, you won't get to the right material. What kind of atmosphere? Is it a corrosive atmosphere? You know, is there hydrogen sulfide, ammonia? Ozone. When my wife saw the anchor, she said, Pirates! Uh, I meant marine environment, <laughs> salt fog. Uh, but she was not entirely wrong. Because actually, uh, one of the function of the material that we sell is actually is to protect you from intellectual property pirates. So if you want to actually keep your secret your design secret, this is something that actually you need to tell us up front because actually we can't offer you something that's transparent, right? Next. What mechanical stress are applied? Is vibration an issue? Is there a possibility that this thing will be scratched? Mechanical shock, right? Next. What kind of voltage are you talking about? Are we talking arcing that you're trying to prevent? Corona? Leakage? These are all parameters in the selection of your material. And other stuff like thin whiskers. We could continue on. There's so many different things. But actually, these are kind of the main ones that normally. If you call us, we will ask you about. Next. What are the key requirements? Very often, actually, you will have specific properties that you need. You have to be upfront with those because actually it's sort of like that delineates an awful lot of materials. Next. Are we trying to meet a specific tan standard that actually doesn't need to be UL 746E certified or IPC certified? What are the certifications that you need? Next. If you don't know these uh, acronyms, you're lucky. Uh, but it can prevent you from going to market. Well, actually, everybody knows our OHS. Beach compliance, well, depends on what you're doing. Uh, if your chemical is not Tesco and DSL listed, we can't sell it to you. <laughs> uh, OSHA and WITIS are our safety standards. So how safe is the material to work with? The US CPA, CARB, et cetera, et cetera. Very important that we know these constraints. We're still in the engineering design process, and I will ask you, hey, does this thing need to be reworked? Yes or no? If you say yes, then I will probably send you towards a thermoplastic or a soft thermoset. If you say no, I'll send you towards a 
current thermoset. The a thermoset is we're actually doing a chemical reaction. It's usually a two-part system, not necessarily, but actually we're making chemical bonds. We're making big macromolecules. So we're taking two pieces and we're making them react together and creating a giant macromolecule. It becomes very hard to, usually, to break apart. You cannot use a solvent normally to, once you form a macromolecule, you can't use a solvent to undo it. It won't work. Thermoplastics, please. There's no chemical bonds. Basically, you're just using the, the uh, interaction between uh, molecules to form the bond. So actually, they're a weaker force. And those actually you can usually take apart with a solvent. They, they also melt. A thermoset will not melt. Mind you, actually, some thermosets, like silicones, are repairable because you can cut them because they're soft. Other thermosets like epoxies and urethanes, they're hard to get through. Next. Then you have to think about your manufacturing process. What kind of drying time and curing time do you want? The ease of application. Is there any special skills and equipment needed? Please. It's very important that you describe the, uh, the equipment that you have on hand. No, if you have something in mind to us before, because actually not all materials can be applied in an easy fashion or a similar fashion. then there's the cost. That will be one filtering parameter for sure. I've seen cases where we went, oh, yes, yes, great, 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 cost will. No, we don't like that one. <laughs> Next. The final step actually is a little bit out of our hands because actually that's the step that we expect that the manufacturer will do themselves. You need to do the testing of the material with your application. So you'll do the shake and bake test, right? Okay, so these in, you'll do our driver electronic, well, electronic performance test. You have to make sure that the coding or the material is not interfering with you know, what you're trying to do. And environment testing. So you put the device in an environment where you is similar to what you want that stress that will be exposed to and see if it will fail. And you want to check that there's no thermal expansion damage, if that's an issue. So, after this test, actually either you accept and that's the end, or you go to check another material that you have, or you restart from the start. That's the engineering design process with respect to material selection. It's probably more than you expected. It's actually very often I get people calling me and they actually they're always surprised at how many questions I'm asking. You guys have a formal uh, checklist or something like that? Not formal because actually uh, the customer very often resists the fact, well, why do you want to know that? <laughs> um, but yes, actually more or less we're following this uh, process. So actually if you go in summary, actually, usually there's kind of a six components. We will want usually to know what the assembly constraints are, what the environmental stress that are applicable, what are your custom requirements, whether this thing is going to be repairable or not, what's your production process that you want. And this part, if you're responsible for, but actually don't skip it. <laughs> and that's a formal engineering selection process for material. So that's my first part. The next part, we're going to talk a little bit about laboratory, laboratory data, reality, and misunderstandings. Uh, 
if we go to the next slide here, uh, in this slide, this shows a, one of our lab. And uh, there's millions of dollars worth of equipment there. So of course, the data we produce is very good. Uh, but how this relates to reality in the real world next, is uh, kind of an open question. In the laboratory environment, the system is very controlled. The experiments we do, we use the best possible samples. We use the best possible methods. We use, you know, we take our time to give uh, very good things. And experiments in the lab are not designed to fail. So actually, usually they're not trying to test for failures per se. So when you look at a technical data sheet, you're looking at best case all of these. And how this relates to the real world is a little bit of an open question because the real world is messy. There's way more things that are out of control that will change the answer. So actually, this comes directly from the IPC handbook, a page guide. They say material qualification, vendor data sheets, data sheets are starting points. And that's why you actually say big disclaimers in technical data sheets. These are not specifications. Because in reality, probably in production, you will never achieve these same exact results. But these are control uh, experiments. And so you'll get very good guidelines to look at. With this in mind, now we'll look at various properties on a technical data sheet with respect to failure modes and what these things tell you about chance of failure. Next, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a tendency uh, in the industry for people to focus on just one property. And very often the focus is off target. <laughs> You might have wondered why I was a bit on the side, because actually very often people like, why do you, I have this question, why are you fixing it on this? And actually, oh, because this is always good. Uh, no, <laughs> it's not always true. So you have to be careful with your rule of thumbs you're using. And try not to get too fixated on, on any particular properties. Look at it in the context it's intended to be looked at. Next, please. Perhaps actually the easiest one to talk about is the Breakdown voltage or data rate. Uh, I think it's a simple concept. Everybody thinks they know this one. So you apply a very high voltage across an insulating material of a determining of a given thickness, and actually after a point, it forms a conductive path. That's your breakdown. There is a common myth in the industry that dielectric breakdowns of polymers are directly proportional to the thickness. No, that's not true. You'll get people that will argue a lot with you about this, but it's not true. Next slide, please. If it was linear, it would be like this. What it is in reality is proportional to the square root of the thickness of your sample. The reason for that is there are imperfections in your, in, your, in your materials. There's micro bubbles, there's contaminants. And while you're doing the breakdown voltage, some of the material melts <coughs> so that you never get the performance, the theoretical performance that you think you're going to get. <coughs> Next. And the electric strength accentuates that the electric strength is just a breakdown voltage divided by the thickness. That's the one that people usually like to look at. So I'm going to get 450 volts per mil, so if I have 10 mils, I'll have 4,500 volts. No. <laughs> not true. Not true. And actually, one of the problems with this is actually sort of like, then people start comparing data sheets from different competitors, and actually, sometimes they for whatever reason, the computer doesn't tell you what thickness they measure the thing, the dielectric voltage at. So if I want a very good dielectric voltage, I can make my 
I choose a tin material, and actually my delicate strength goes through the roof. And oh wow, this is a wonderful material. No, <laughs> it's the same material. We just you change it with respect to the thickness. Just so you know, uh, for epoxies, uh, fine compounds, uh, encapsulants, normally you want to get a thickness of one eighth of an inch as your reference. If the vendor provided them a different thing, that's okay. You can use the Tautcher equation and get the value at one eighth of an inch, and then, then you'll be able to know what's the standard value. And actually, you can find out with using the Tautcher equation what the the dielectric breakdown will be for any thickness. If you're talking about uh, conformal coating, it will be one mil thickness, 25 microns. So these are the two reference points are normally used in the industry. If uh, technical data sheet doesn't show you these values, ask your vendor and they will know. Because you need to know what the thickness is, otherwise you'll get the values wrong. Sorry, what was that one, one eighth again? One eighth of an inch. For what? The thickness of your material. Yeah, I understand. For what application? Any. Electrics. Any polymer. If you want to compare one polymer with another or with another, if it's a potting compound, actually, usually, they will, we will all the industry, we kind of agreed informally to use one-eighth of an inch as a standard. Oh, I see, I see. 3.175 millimeters, if you want. <laughs> right? Next. Um, if you look at the electric strength at one-eighth of an inch, actually, and you compare various material, there's a range, but actually, you'll find that actually we're all performing in exactly, well, more or less the same area. It's not usually a great selection criteria, uh, unless actually you're looking for a very specific thing, and then you would look at the specific material. So you'll never select it according to the, 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 the chemical family. I don't have a value for the fluoropolymer for the NOPEC material, uh, but I imagine it's going to be the same as the other ones. No, in the same range. So next, uh, so. Just to say, usually that's not the driving force in the selection of material. Uh, but you should ask, you know, if, if you're having a problem or you're trying to mitigate uh, dielectric strength. You no, know, you want to, you know, you have an arcing possibility. You want to actually get the exact value so you can calculate the exact value of the thickness that you need. Right? Next. Uh, some people actually want to look at volume resistivity, so basically based on home. Well, it's a little bit like the breakdown voltage, except here, the volume resistivity, we've normalized the size of the sample to take out this size variation. See, scientists love to get rid of uh, parameters that complicate things. Uh, it's not a great selection criteria uh, because you'll see that like the electric strength, you're always in the same range. <laughs> Unless you want to compare this material is slightly better than the other one, uh, that's, that's what you would use a voluntary uh, volume resistivity for. Next. Uh, surface resistance, you should really not use. It will be provided to you by many uh, vendors. Actually, we could provide it also in our summer stuff, but actually, there's many kind of problems. Here, what you're doing is you're actually taking two probes and putting it on the top instead of going across the material. And you're basically, essentially, mimicking the, what, the, um, what the resistance would be across you know, just the surface. So I'll take the shortest path. Trouble is actually, what's the thickness? Uh, it's not a very good value. Uh, scientifically speaking, it's a very weak, ill-defined term. Next. And just to give you an idea, uh, if you look at the volume resistivity, it's all a 10 to 15 range, more or less. They're all insulating materials. For most applications that you have, actually, so this is way more than enough. So, 
Volume resistivity is good for comparing, comparing two different products, but it's not a really great symmetry printer. It won't help you that much. I prefer using dielectric breakdown, knowing what the true thickness was. Next. Uh, let's talk at the new energy resistance, actually. Uh, we saw already, you know, there's quite a few things about you know, hydrophobicity, water retention, permeability. There's various parameters that will uh, be given to you. Uh, one of my pet peeves is actually, uh, lots of people say hydrophobic means repels water. Uh, no, uh, that's not quite right. And I'll go over why that is not quite right. One thing that you should keep in mind is all protective polymers, no matter which one they are, are water resistant, not waterproof. If they're applied thin, they'll be water resistant. That means they're all permeable to a certain degree. So actually, if you have a thin coating and actually you do an immersion test, usually that's pretty unreasonable. It will fail. It will work for a short period of time, but it will fail, guaranteed. Next. Hydrophobic actually should be better named water indifferent. It just means it doesn't interact strongly with water or it's, it's weakly bonded with it. Uh, the nice thing with hydrophobic materials, there's less water retention. It beads off and flows off easier because of the <coughs> contact angle is high, low surface energy and it dries faster. Next. Just to give you an idea, um, showing a bit of chemistry here. At a glance, a chemist can look at this and say, well, urethanes are gonna be fairly uh, hydrophobic, uh, sorry, hydrophilic, and polyformers, silicones, and peroxides air will be in the uh, hydrophobic area, so it'll, it won't interact strongly with water, and epoxies and acrylic will be in, be in between. And the reason I can say that is because I can look at these, as you them, and I can see sites where water can interact and hydrogen bond to. Hydrogen bonding has a lot to do with what is so uh, wet. And hydrogen bonding is actually, when you say hydrophilic, it, it sticks actually, so there's a force there that's holding it. When you look at the silicone, or peroxide, or actually a fluoropolymer, there's no groups where the water can actually hydrogen bond to. So it doesn't mean it fears water, it just means it's indifferent, it doesn't see it. Next. I think that, uh, well actually, uh, when we were discussing the 3M coding, we saw this experiment exactly, the monitor twister insulation uh, resistance test for component coatings. The cycle goes from 25 to 65 temperature wise. The relative humidity is kept at 50. That means that actually there's a dew point at 51. And that, so at 51 degrees Celsius, there is dew that forms on the, so on the component coating. And what happens actually when, when you do this cycle over and over again, actually this, this humidity actually results in a drop in, in resistance. So actually once you start mixing different types of tests, electricity with water, you get to get a greater appreciation for the effects on regularization. Now, actually, so like, just to caution you against actually saying things like, oh, urethanes are always the better ones, or silicones are always the better ones, or it's, here's a urethane, that's my best one here, more scintillating. Here's another urethane, actually, that's my worst one. It depends on the chemistry, what we did, what the chemist did to try to modify the chemistry. So generally speaking, for all these different types of material, actually, the relative resistance is actually fairly good for all of them. However, actually, some are, are noteworthy and actually very good for 
hurricanes, uh, the proxies and ferric silings are very good at resisting. Uh, they're very uh, non-permeable, generally speaking. Silicones are highly permeable. But as Curtis had mentioned, they don't allow, they let the water in, but it also lets it out. So actually, it's not terrible. Uh, for hydrophobic, actually, you'll look at silicones, paroxysilines, and fluoropolymers, which we saw, the three end products. They're all very nice. They all cost a little bit more than these better chemistry. So cost is a uh, something that matters to you. That's going to be something that you'll have to consider. Something that people don't usually think about when they talk about humidity is actually the IBC recombinant thickness. There's a reason why this thickness is there. And many customers actually aggravate me by saying, we're going to apply it at the maximum thickness because that's going to provide maximum protection. No. Next slide. Here. That's a myth. The thicker the coating does not mean the better it protects against humidity. It can if you apply it thick enough. However, as you go thicker, it takes longer for the humidity to come in and come out. So if you have very thin coating, you have to, if it goes in, you can go out fat easily, so it doesn't stay trapped. If you have a very high thickness, you increase the chance of having voids at board, board level. If you have a void at board, board level, when your humidity goes down, you'll stay trapped in there and you'll create a corrosive soup and also not have a problem. If you have greater thickness, you increase the CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion. You increase the danger of craggings, things like that. So there goes your uh, you need resistance, you have a crack in your coating. You're applying more stress, there's more chance with thicker coatings of delamination, coating cracking, board formation, solvent entrapment. That's why I shaved the, when, uh, the discussion of the 3M coating. He said, don't apply more than five coatings. Well, actually, more than five it is the thicker you go, the harder it is for the solvent to get out. You can do it, but you have to use special techniques, usually, which people don't have the time to. And actually, the thicker it is, the greater the drying time. Uh, an interesting thing, actually, for the, the, for the corrosive guys and brine, actually, the permeability gives you a fairly good idea of what's going to happen if you're exposed. Um, urethanes, epoxies, and paroxylenes have got low penetrations. Actually, from what I saw of the 3M talk, I probably will say that fluoropromomers also seem to have low penetration, <laughs> low permeation. Silicons have got, are, there's, because of this, the length of the silicon oxygen thing, there's more space between the molecules, so it, there's more space for the, the gas to get in there. So, the, the corrosive gas might not attack the silicone, but actually you have to be careful about attacking the components below. Right? So these are things that you need to take care of. Next. Now actually let's talk about coefficient of terminal expansion. Uh, general rules, if it's a hard polymer, large CT image map is big stress. And elastic polymers, low model modulus equals less stress. Uh, when you do your selection, you should really be doing it based on the TG, the glass transition temperature, the coefficient of the expansion, and the elastic modulus together along with the temperature range you'll be experiencing. Um, and actually, sort of when you're doing your stress test, try to use reasonable ranges because we can make anything fail. Making stuff fail is easy. The coefficient of thermal expansion, CTE, describes how the size of a material changes with temperature. For example, the CTE of metals are typically around 10 part per million per degree C. This means that a meter long metal bar undergoing a temperature change of 10 degrees Celsius would increase by a length of 100 microns. In contrast, 
polymers have higher CT values and they exhibit a more complex behavior than metals. For example, before the glass transition temperature, epoxies exhibit glass-like behavior. A typical CTE value in that region would be about 50 part per million per degree C. But after the TG, the epoxy becomes rubberized and the thermal expansion coefficient almost doubles. Compared to metals, this would create a mismatch factor of 5 and compared to silicone, a mismatch factor of 16. Therefore, the greatest amount of stress due to CTE mismatches always occurs past the TG temperature. If I cut two pieces of material, one is a, a silicone and your one is would be my serine polymers. At zero degrees Celsius, they'd be the same. So I cut them exactly the same. I increase the temperature, then one is going to expand more than the other one. And actually, as I pass the glass transition te temperature, it actually is going to expand even more. And actually, so you're going to have a higher difference in stress after the TG than before. What that means is actually, if I glue these two pieces together, because these things are expanding at different rates, actually you'll have a different sort of stress. This thing will actually buckle. You'll see it. And you have the elimination, the bonding, cracking, the decryption. There is a myth that the material with the lowest CTE will always offer the best stress relief. That is not true. I have highlighted the two best class of materials for stress release in red. You will note that silicone has the highest CTE value. But as we'll see later, this is compensated by a low modulus. Paracetamol has both low CTE and low modulus. Just as a general sort of, not so much as a selection parameter, but actually Below the uh, glass transition temperature, the, your substance will be more brittle, have greater tensile strength, will not elongate as much, will be harder, and have a smaller expansion coefficient. The lowest is the difference, so basically it's the opposite. So actually, sort of like, if you can manage to stay below this TG, actually you're gonna reduce the permeability. That's an interesting fact. If you can have something with a very high TG, you're decreasing the permeability. One thing, actually, if you're having two-part system, uh, how high the current temperature is actually can affect your TG. So the TG provided in your technical data sheet will be for a specific cure condition. It will not be what you have if, if you use a different cure temperature. If you use higher, you'll get better results, and if you use lower, you get worse results. Next. The Young's modulus is the measure of the stiffness of material. Another straight material has got a low modulus. A hard material has got a high modulus. Remember that the modulus decreases with increasing temperature. So basically, you know, if you apply a load to a material, then actually you apply a cut, it will the form, if you remove that load, it'll come back. That's basically the degree of deformation is more or less what your modulus is. Next. Uh, be careful, low modulus material tend to have a very high CTE. Now, actually, what does this mean for material selection? Next. There's some people, actually, that use CTE as their sole criteria for selecting what material to choose. Here's the problem. Some of the stuff with the high CTEs, the silicones and some of the urethanes, have got very low modulus. The modulus can undo the stress from the high CTE. So that's why it doesn't really matter that the silicone has got a high value. Uh, the ones from Momentum have actually had a lower CTE value, but they're still quite significant. Because the stress you experience, your component you experience, is a function of the CTE difference of the, the, the different materials. 
the power modulus, and the temperature difference. If you start looking at these three values together, you get a much better sense of which material to select. One important point that actually that uh, Clarissa made actually is that uh, silicon carbons actually have got an extremely high temperature range. And because of this low modulus, they can be used in the very different, well, in very extreme environments. So silicon, despite having a very low Kg and high CTE, is an excellent material for some applications. Some urethanes actually are soft. No, they've got the low modulus. So those can be used in that similar situation. If you get a hard urethane, don't use it. <laughs> right? So these are the sort of things you need to think about. And actually, if you call us, actually, we'll try to walk you through what this thing, as long as you tell us what your real parameters are. Different materials offer a different degree of resistance to electrical field formation. The dielectric constant provides a measure of this resistance relative to forming a field in vacuum. At a given frequency, the electric materials will polarize and store electrical energy. The higher the electric constant, the slower an electric signal will travel, which impacts the performance. The dissipation factor, also called the loss factor, measures how much power is absorbed into the insulator at a given frequency. A high dissipation factor results in a power loss. It measures how inefficient an insulating material is. Generally, the lower the dielectric constant and dissipation factor, the better. Please note that significant humidity absorption can lead to signal loss because pure water has a high loss factor of 73. Some uh, silicones actually and paracetamols are actually have very low the dielectric constants and dissipation factors. Uh, urethane are usually not so good. The rest actually are okay. And actually, these are generalization. I'm not sort of like don't look at the actual values for the for the material. These can be a factor or not, depending on what you're trying to design. And remember that these are frequency dependent. Next. So it can be part of the next of your selection process. Um, with respect to thermal plastics, actually, uh, usually uh, any thermal plastics has got poor solvent resistance. Uh, maybe with the exception of absorbed powder, because actually it takes a very specific problem, uh, solvent to to dissolve it. Thermoplastics are very easy to apply. They're very easy to remove. Uh, so they're very good for a rework. Um, but uh, sometimes, actually, they're, the fact they're not solvent resistant is a big problem. So actually, you'll end up with the thermosets. Thermosets have got a great solvent resistance in general. Uh, the silicone is easy to repair because you can cut it, usually. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, repairing epoxy, repairing uh, urethane, uh, people will say urethane is repairable. Yeah, uh, it, it is, but it's not going to be easy. And most thermosets actually are often the two-part system. They have special application methods, and actually they can problems happen. Uh, just so you know, uh, if I see thermoplastic, usually I think solvent evaporation cure system. Usually it's a solvent system. And actually, uh, when we say solvent resistant, remember that there is no such thing as a universal solvent. So there is no such thing as a universally solvent resistant coating or powder matter. Next. So actually, what I've shown you, I hope, is that the selection of material is actually a fairly complex thing. You have many choices. The reason there's many different chemistries is because actually we're trying to serve many different needs. When 
you think about material selection process, I'm hoping that you'll remember the engineering design steps that you need to go through. And maybe think of contacting your vendor when you need to use expertise on the material because actually we also want you to have low production costs, faster time to market, and fewer in service failures. So we'll always try to give you steer you towards the best material possible. Thank you.